Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to Media Life here at TV3 at Desawe in Kanda Accra. My name is Park Siasari. Coming up in the next 60 minutes. Coming up, the National Democratic Congress and the New Patriotic Party have been locked up in a crunch meeting to end political party vigilantism. If we see anybody doing any of these things... And also, Great Co warns it will be shoot. Not to me. As there are attempts to ban its main pipelines. And also on the international front, Algerian parliament is due to elect an interim president following forced resignation of 82-year-old Abdelaziz Bouteflika. We've got details of these stories, plus many more coming up in the next 60 minutes. Be reminded that we're streaming live on Facebook. You can also join us with your views, comments, and suggestions on any of our top headline stories. Visit any of our social media pages on Facebook and on Twitter. Now, the much-anticipated meeting between the new Patriotic Party and the National Democratic Congress to disband vigilante groups within both parties is underway. The meeting, organized by the National Peace Council, is aimed at setting out the modalities for the disbandment process. Now, top hierarchy of both parties, including Freddie Blay and Dan Botre of the New Patriotic Party, and Johnson Esiedu Nketiah and Samuel Fosu Ampofo of the NDC, are present for the meeting which, uh, which has been held behind closed doors. No media has been allowed into the meeting. My colleague uh, Martin uh, Asiru Date. Right, so my colleague uh, Martin Asiru Date has joined us live on Skype and uh, we're going to speak to him briefly. Martin, thank you very much for your time. Uh, so can you tell us exactly what you've been picking up from this meeting? Hello. Yes, uh, the meeting started at around, uh, around 10 thereabouts and uh, from what we have gathered, it is not open to the media yet, certainly because of the premise. Uh, you will recall that after the back and forth of the letters between the chairman of the letter that was sent to the president, the Peace Council stepped into the discussion and said that, all right, we will hold this meeting with you and set the, the, you know, set the precedent so we can start making progress. What they have done is to call both parties to set the modalities of what the key elements of this meeting will be. So today, for instance, what we have done is that they are going to be discussing issues surrounding whether they both accept the Atlantic uh, group, what steps internally they intend to take to disband them, and how both parties can work together with the national security and all the other stakeholders and the media to disband the Atlantic group. And of course, uh, some of the key personnel we've seen here on both sides are uh, the top hierarchy of the party. Um, from the NDC side, you're looking at the likes of John Slater, Bim Chetia, Kofi Tito, Bim Kwache. I also saw Foster Bani, who is a former chief of staff, um, Kakra Esamwa, um, one of the strong NDC men when it comes to the central region. Uh, and also um, uh, Abraham Mamaiba, who is one of the lead, member of the legal council of the NDC. Uh, when you come to the NPP side, you, we saw the likes of Freddie Bay, the national chair of the NPP, and some other top members of the hierarchy of the party. So at least the personnel that have come from both parties to this are committed to the cause and take it seriously. That is why they're sending these uh, you know, crop of people to come and sit in the discussion. On the side of the clergy, we have seen uh, Archbishop Duncan Williams, who's also in that meeting, and then also um, uh, uh, Reverend Okoku. You know. So we are yet to hear anything concrete from the meeting while sitting and uh, you know nosing around there being there were moments within the meeting where voices were louder than usual so it was you could tell that it's a bit heated there but it is all in anticipation of finding an amicable solution to this particular problem so we'll keep an eye on what's happening within the media has been looking at the president then, based on the agreements and the, and the fundamentals will come out with, then they will now agree whether to add other political parties or open the, the bracket to get other people in, other stakeholders in for an amicable discussion. So that is what I can report from the central hotel here in Accra. 
All right, thank you very much, Martin, the city that's uh, our correspondent who's live there uh, from that uh, meeting be between the National Democratic Congress and the New Patriotic Party to find a lasting solution to the menace of vigilantism in the country. I'm going to go live on the phone lines now to speak to Dr. Edward Brenya. He's a political scientist at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. Thank you very much, sir, for your time. So we know the president has already set in motion a legislation to ban uh, political vigilantism. Uh, does it throw this meeting off the table? Um, good afternoon. Good afternoon, table listeners of TV3. I did not hear the latter part of the question, so if you could please repeat it for me. Yeah, I was asking that the president has already set in motion a legislation to ban political vigilantism. I'm wondering if this meeting uh, in any way throws, a me uh, throws the whole uh, idea by the president out of the table. Um, I think that, um, yes, the president taking the steps. Um, to initiate a legislation as he did warn the political parties that if they didn't meet on um, those uh, the week that he wanted them to meet, that he would have uh, he would initiate a legislation. But I don't think that a legislation necessarily takes anything away from um, this meeting because you know Ghana, one of our biggest problems is not making the rule or making a law or putting in place a legislation; it's the implementation. So if these individuals through this meeting are able to come up with um, a resolution that amicably allows them to disband their uh, vigilante groups or political militia, as we recently called them, I think this may be more effective than the legislation that is being put out by the president. We know also that the Peace Council is the arbiter at this meeting. Uh, do you think something concrete will come up? It depends on how the Peace Council uh, actually exercises uh, I mean, arbitration rule. If the Peace Council, as is being perceived, especially in the opposition, comes out to become a neutral arbiter and allow the two parties to put out their condition and find a better and amicable way of addressing those so, I mean, problems, then I think something good could come out. But if the Peace Council come and put up a poster that has in the past been in the mind of um, any of these political parties when they find itself in opposition, aside with the government of the day, then I think the outcome may not be anything different from what the government puts up. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Edward Brenya is a political science lecturer at the Kwame Kwame University of Science and Technology. Away from that, a ranking member of uh, you're still watching Media Life here on TV3. Remember, we're streaming live on Facebook. Now, away from that, no, still on the NPP and the NDC, the chairperson of the National Commission on Civic Education, Josephine Nkrumah, is urging the two parties to show good faith in their deliberations. In good faith, you should come to the table and find a, a, a roadmap, or let's formulate a roadmap to disband it and uproot it from our body to politics. So we say it in every sense of the word that we don't just want the rhetoric that we've heard in the past, but this time round, we have come to a crossroads and it's important that we find real lasting solutions to this and stop the lip service to. In relation to Small Arms and um, Light Weapons Commission, that indeed is their work. And it's something that they, they, they do and they have the expertise to do. So that recommendation is to further strengthen that point that they should be resourced to carry out their work. I know in the past they have called on the return of, of arms. And these are some of the things we want to see the Small Arms and Light Weapons Commission doing seriously and targeted at the party militia, party vigilante groups. In other news, ranking member of Parliament's Education Committee has asked government to back off interference in activities of public universities to ensure full autonomy. Peter Nochu has strongly kicked against the proposed universities bill, which is yet to be laid before Parliament. So far, uh, I have not seen the draft bill in its full form, but uh, with the pieces and the bits of information that we have gathered so far, emanating from uh, the draft bill, uh, you will realize that uh, the bill in its form, if it is allowed to pass, 
is going to have a, a very telling effect on academic freedom of the universities because the bill is attempting to take away the autonomy of the universities. Uh, every university in this country is established by an act of parliament and by that act of parliament the university is empowered to run it, its own um, activities. It has its own regulations, which they call statutes. So in those statutes, the universities are able to manage their own affairs, right from uh, the appointment of a, a vice chancellor to academic work. Once you have institutions backed by act of parliament, you should allow those institutions to perform within the law that establishes them. And then what government is to do is once you have your representatives over there, you allow them to monitor and report back to you. It, in the first case, it is the necessary interference of government that created the problem. You see it. So if government backs out of its interference, in the affairs of public universities, this situation wouldn't have arisen. All right, so we're going to stay a while longer on this subject. It's a developing story. Clement Park is Deputy Ranking Member on Parliament's Education Committee. He's just joined me in the studio. Clement, good to have you, and thanks very much for making time for us here on Midday Live. So why is the minority against this uh, draft bill? Well, first of all, let me say good afternoon to your good self and right. to uh, viewers across the country. Yeah. And uh, to put uh, this conversation in the right perspective, as uh, we just had the Honorable Nochu speak, mm. uh, as members of parliament, uh, the bill has not come to us formally. And uh, this is very important for the sake of public discourse and a proper understanding. But this is not to say that uh, there is a doubt uh, with regards to government having something like this in mind coming to parliament. And I think it is around that conversation that the public became aware of what was going on. And that began with a post uh, by Professor Jampo, uh, who posted on his Facebook to the effect that the bill that government is trying to bring to parliament, which he has seen, uh, clearly was one that if presented and accepted in the form that he had seen it, was going to be inimical to the autonomy of institutions of, of higher learning mm. and indeed would impact and impinge on academic freedom. But since then, uh, the conversation has advanced to the effect that some of us, even members of parliament, although it has not come to us through the requisite avenues, we have had chance to see what is being talked about. And what have you seen? And from what I've seen, uh, the, the proposed uh, changes, uh, I believe in totality, uh, are unjustified. I, I truly don't think that the case has been made for why we should have one single law, which is the ultimate intent of government, governing our public universities. That case, to me, seeing what I've seen so far, has not been made. Uh, the example is that the, 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 the various acts, if you like, the charters that bring into being these universities, uh, the internal mechanisms available to the universities for managing themselves and to ensure that academic freedom, freedom of association, and all of the things that we all want to see in higher institutions are present, mm. are still present in the old uh, law. So, okay, so what is the need just, and what is the justification just hold on me. Just to, to throw try and a, change a bit more light on what Dr. Clement Apak is talking about. Now, some of the proposals uh, contained in this uh, bill, for instance, grant the president uh, absolute power to dissolve the university council, That's right. uh, to allow the university council to appoint a chancellor, That's right. and also to allow unions to appoint only one representative on a rotational system to serve on the council at each cycle. So that's what Clement Apak is talking about. Exactly. This is inimical to academic freedom it is. and to the autonomy of the various universities. Uh, exp uh, can you explain more? I will, I will quickly yeah. ex explain. Mm. You know, every university uh, has its internal structures. The governing council is the highest decision making body. And of course, the academic component is usually under the auspices of what we call the academic board. Now, if you look at the 
structure as it is, although the universities are autonomous and each of them has its own charter and uh, do's and don'ts, so mm. to speak. The proposal to unify all under the auspices of this uh, Public Universities Act is then saying that every university council will be composed of nine members. Mm. And out of these nine, mm. the president appoints the chairperson and four other persons, including a woman, that is already five. Mm. Now, the vice chancellor, by default, also is a member of council. council. Now, the arrangement as we have it is that the vice chancellor is usually appointed by council. So, by default, it is the case that if and when there's a need for a vote on critical matters, he is likely to side with the majority on council. Right. But what is also more disturbing is the decision to try and reduce the presence of other stakeholders in a university environment. Mm. In this case, the proposal is going to deny every autonomous union on campus the right to have its own representative. Mm. What is being proposed is that all of the, 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 the unions on campus at every point in time will select one representative right. to represent Utah, all, Tewu, all the, exactly, the SRC. Exactly. Mm. And that is certainly untenable. Mm. Is government taking a cue from what must have happened in KNUST as well as UAW where over the period uh, we've had decisions of vice chancellors uh, certainly lead to chaos and eventually the back stops with government? Well, I think that if that is the motivation then government got it wrong. Mm. Some of us have argued, and we would continue to argue, that it is largely the external or political interference that has led to in this. the functionality of our institutions mm. of high learning mm. that has led to mm. some of these occurrences. Mm. I'll come that, back together an that, example that, that, that of that political interference you talk about. Let me get on the phone lines again and speak to uh, Peter Party, and he's executive director of the Institute of Education Studies. Peter, uh, thank you for your time. Um, First of all, what's your general overview of the draft bill? Um, is it prudent, for instance, for the bill to be uh, introduced now? Thank, thank you very much. Yes, I, I really, it is important that as uh, society changes, we look at the laws that govern our institutions and we make changes to reflect the, 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 the current situation in, in our society. However, we think that the Drug bill has to be presented to the various universities should be uh, looked at again because, um, as we are all aware, the, 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 there seems to be an indication that government wants to take control over the public universities. And we, we think that at, at, at this stage of our development, we need a stronger university environment that would help shape policy, that would, that would, uh, would help sustain our democracy and that can speak uh, uh, to authority when need be. If we push this thing through, it means that we are increasing the powers of the executive that we've complained about always and we are likely to succumb our public university to the authorities of a politician. But, but Peter, the, the, the overbearing influence of the university um, or, uh, you know, the overbearing influence of, of political actors, I beg your pardon, the overbearing influence of the university has not curtailed uh, the unruly behavior of students, has not curtailed uh, the unwarranted destruction to properties which you've seen lately happen at KNUST as well as the EU, UEW, has it? Yeah, but that should not be a reason why we would legislate uh, uh, the, the, the overbearing influence. As we stand now, there are instances where we are all aware that gov uh, government have made moves to remove certain principal officers of our public university, but have been resisted because of the statutes and the act that establish these particular public universities. So if we are moving a step further to legislate the overbearing influence of government on our public universities, the extent that the, the, the government of the day will have the power to dissolve the, the, the university council in a state when there's a, 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 a supposed emergency, then, then we, we are losing the independence, we are losing the autonomy, and we are losing the, the, the power that has been given to the universities that they would use it to, 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 to uh, um, challenge or to help deepen the democracy that we have in this country. This is not a discussion we should be having at this time. Mm. At this time, we should be talking about how we are expanding our structure at our various universities, how we are preparing our universities to take up the, the enormous number of students that will be coming up from the, the, public, uh, the public senior high schools as a result of the CSHS.
All right, Peter, I've got to say a big thank you to you, Peter. Uh, Party Ant is executive director of the Institute of Education Studies. Uh, uh, Clement, quickly talk about the political interference you've, 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 you've just uh, yes. noted. Yes, uh, and I, I think that I agree with the commentary so far. Mm. And I must add that other um, senior members of uh, academia, retired vice chancellors, and, and, and even other well-meaning Ghanaians mm. who have heard this, uh, clearly are shocked because in many ways this is actually taking us back into the so the absolute power and control yes. of, of, yeah, of mean, political when, actors. When you, you allow the government appointees to be dominant on council, and council then appoints the chancellor, council appoints the vice chancellor, at the same time that the president is also being given the power to dissolve a council. Quite clearly, we have lost the independence of the institution. Mm -hmm. There is a reason why, even in, in what we believe is still sacrosanct, and there's no need to be fidgeted with the political influence as much as possible has been reduced. But even so, but, but, if but we Clement, take the example, Clement, I, I get your point. But if at every point in time decisions are taken by the university council and they almost always go wrong, and government will have to step in to intervene, then what are we well, doing? Actually, it is the interference that leads to. Give me an example of that. Just give me an Let's example. Give you an example mm. of what is going on at uh, UEW. Okay. We all know how that started. Uh, there was a, a case that was brought forward, a report where it was filed with one of the state investigative bodies against a former vice chancellor, Professor Avoke, and his team. Whilst uh, these processes were ongoing, uh, council made a decision to get somebody to become an acting vice uh, chancellor, mm. uh, which, which was done. Mm. In, in that period, we then became aware that the processes that one would expect to be followed in the selection of a substantive vice chancellor were not followed. Were not, because usually uh, a search committee uh, would be uh, formed and unveiled. Those who qualify would apply. Uh, the committee would go through uh, and, and, and select the candidates that they believe have the requisite qual uh, qualifications. It is narrowed down to about two. The whole public lectures to outline their visions and uh, uh, their missions for why they want to be mm. vice chancellor. And amongst the two, the person that is most impressive based on a, a very realistic, you know, bottom up approach. And you say in that, that case, there overwhelming evidence of, of political. What we are saying is mm. that in the case of UEW, mm. all of this didn't happen. Mm. If all the processes that I have narrated mm. were allowed to happen in selecting mm. the current vice chancellor mm. at UEW, mm. what happened would not have happened. Mm. It was because that happened mm. that then created the animosity between those who felt that proper processes and procedure were not followed because mm. of the political interference. Mm. And largely so because at the time, the lawyers of the former vice chancellor mm. had indicated that it wasn't proper for His Excellency the President to, have come to attend for the, the investiture. Uh, but investiture. He did. And right. by doing so, mm. he gave authentication yeah. to what many believe was an illegal process. Right. And that is what has led to the current to and fro right. between those perceived to be sympathetic right. or loyal. So, so you are going to fight this tooth and nail to uh, ensure that it, it, it doesn't well, go Well, it hasn't come to mm. us yet Once it Parliament. comes to you... But we, I am excited mm. about the public discourse. Right. The fact that people from... All backgrounds are saying that this is not necessary. What we have is working, and that we should focus attention on the more pressing issues debilitating our educational sector. Clement Park, I've, I've got to say a big thank you. Thank you very much. Clement Park is the deputy ranking member of Parliament's Education Committee uh, joining us here on Midday Live. You're still watching Midday Live here on TV3. Still ahead, we've got international news, we've got business. Uh, and we've got sports. We will not hesitate to shoot and kill, uh, kill not to maim. These were the words of the head of the security of the Ghana Great Company, uh, Major Lawrence Apia, retired as he sounded a strong warning to some individuals who attempted burning some pipelines belonging to the Cyrus Oil, Cyrus Oil Services Limited in Tema. My colleague Selma Menya is with a team of journalists who are at the location and brings us updates. Uh, no services. Yes, you, you are head of security and you think that, uh, or you've come to the conclusion that this is a sabotage. Why so? Uh, it is so because uh, the line you can draw between a sabotage and a criminal activity is what the perpetrators stand to benefit immediately from the act. I've told you previously that Grigo has said that there are times scrap dealers will take some of our tower members just to go and sell and make a living. 
And so like what happened the last time, you don't expect anybody to cut a whole pylon down with a life power on top and still pick nothing away. So what would be their intention? Your guys are as good as mine. Now this pipe for Saros here is supposed to be transferred with liquid fuel or gas or whatever. And you come to put ties on it to burn it. It is. All right, and you're saying that um, you know has state to take some form of action. I'm saying that people do this, and the, in the, the the issue will be arrest, arrest. Sometimes you cannot arrest because what the man is doing, where he can run to and order. And I'm saying that we have soldiers in the enclave, as you saw them at the gate patrolling. If we see anybody doing any of these things, and arrest is not possible, we will shoot to kill, not to maim. All right, your men were not able to apprehend them. So does it call for a beef up of security after the pylons were yes, also cut we down? Review our security until it happened recently. We were not thinking about a threat of cutting a pylon, now, but now our eyes are open. And as I said earlier, I'm not going to tell the perpetrators who are looking at me life what we have in place. But the bottom line is that they should stand firm and be very careful because we will deal with it. All right, so that was a word of caution from the head of security at Greco. That is a Major Lawrence Apia retired. Selo Mamenya for TV3 News. Tema. Selo Mamenya has joined us in studio. Selo, uh, so you've been to Cyrus Oil. Uh, what did you see? Well, actually, these pipelines are not uh, specifically at Cyrus Oil. They are between Greco and VRA. And these pipelines, I'm told by uh, the head of security of Cyrus, that they run all the way to the western side of Cyrus. They also connect to the Tema Oil Refinery, as well as some other OMCs that Cyrus supplies to, including Shell and uh, also uh, Total Gas. And what's their suspicion? Well, uh, they, they feel that maybe the people suspected, one, they suspected that there could be fuel running through. Uh, he told us that it is an ongoing project. That is how come that part of the pipeline is not covered. It is an ongoing project. So luckily, there isn't fuel running through. But the point is that if you want to see fuel out of such uh, a pipeline and you are going to uh, put fire to it, it means that there's going to be an explosion, an explosion that will be quite devastating. Look at all these places that these pipelines connect to, the Tema Oil Refinery, the Tema Harbor, and all other places. So uh, what they are saying they are going to do is to ensure that they cover it as soon as possible and also deploy more men. And the suspicion is that people, individuals, are responsible for this? Yes, the suspicion is that it's a clear sabotage, according to the head of security. You heard him mm. saying that it is a clear and sabotage. And that is why they will not hesitate to shoot and kill. To shoot and kill, and also maim, not to maim. Mm. Maim means that maybe you want to shoot your leg so mm. you cannot run, mm. but we're going to ensure that if we are shooting you, we're going to kill you. That is wow. the warning he is sounding. Mm. We also took the opportunity to visit where the pylons were actually brought down two weeks ago, mm. and work is ongoing assiduously. The technical man in charge, he says that within two weeks, uh, they should be done. It's quite a hectic job, mm. but uh, he is assuring us that within two weeks, they should be, be done. done. All right, thank you very much. Selo Amenio uh, is a man on the beat. Uh, to this afternoon on our MTN Video Report, our citizen journalist Rafael Dogbe reports on a high-tension cable which has been left unattended to in a gutter for almost two years. This cable is a high-tension cable. This cable has been left unattended to for almost two years now and I don't know what they are waiting to happen before they come and attend to this cable. Children play here. We've reported this case to the authorities but to no avail. We are calling on the authorities to come and attend to this cable before there's disaster. I'm Rafael Dobe, Takradi, Adintin. All right, just, just what, uh, via WhatsApp on 055-1433044. That's 055-1433044. You're still watching Media Live here on TV3. We're still streaming live on Facebook. Keep your messages coming in on any of our top stories this hour. Uh, we're active on social media, Facebook, and on Twitter. Still ahead, we've got the very latest in business news. We've got sports. We've got international news.
Hello, Alva, and welcome to the business news segment on Midday Live. Now, Head of Public Affairs at the Bank of Ghana, AC Hammond, says the newly printed CD notes with security-enhanced features will come with what the central bank said is improved durability and machine readability. She says the new notes will have enhanced security features. So the improved features include an optically variable magnetic image, also known as Spark Live. The enhancement is a glossy, color-changing image of the Kari shell currently on the 10 Ghana CD note. On the 20 CD note, a shiny star will appear, and on the 50 Ghana CD note, a glistening cocoa pod. When the note is tilted, a high-polished line will stretch across each image that will move up and down and change color from gold to green. A new security thread called Rapid will be an illuminated broken line that runs horizontally through the note. When tilted, the star will expand and contract while the denomination value stays in place. A more prominent watermark will appear. It will be the image of the Ghanaian agriculturalist Tatakwashi and a cocoa pod. Against light, the watermark will appear transparently on both sides of the note. Head of Public Affairs at Bank of Ghana, Isi Haman explains what led to the decision to introduce the new notes. You know, the currency management, usually seven years there apart, you find that um, currency notes are changed. You know, and these are also built in some durability, make sure they are machine readable. So it will enhance the um, features that we are introducing. A polished gold band with gold bars on the back will be printed on the new banknotes. The iridescent band will stretch from top to bottom and will become visible when held against light. In other news, the Trades Union Congress, TUC, has rejected the 50% cut in benchmark values announced by government last week. According to the TUC, the move would increase imports and further depreciate the local currency. Secretary General of the Trades Union Congress, Dr. Yao Ba, who spoke with correspondent Daniel Pokwin Accra, said the 50% cut in benchmark values should rather have been on some selected imported items. The Trade Union Congress, TUC, was saddened about the 50% cut in benchmark values of imports announced by the Vice President at a town hall meeting last week. But the TUC, after carefully analyzing the tariff regime, said the 50% would increase unnecessary imports. The TUC again argued that a reduction in tariff would affect the strength of the city against the other foreign currencies. Secretary General of TUC, Dr. Yaoban, rather suggested that the 50% should have been on some selected imports. I never expected that you would do a blanket 50% reduction in everything. Mm. I say everything good. that comes to this country. No, I, say it's not good. I don't think it's good for everything. Uh, no, it's too much. Especially for those items you can produce here. Maybe government might have targeted it a bit so that all the things we cannot produce or we don't have the capacity to produce but are good for us. Those ones, if you reduce, it increases standard of living. We need to do more in the area of export. I don't think the policy to reduce tariffs blanket the way they have done it is the best. He again said the government should immediately review the 50% cut in import duty. We need to start thinking about import substitution. And if you want to think about import substitution, the way to go is to reduce tariffs. No. The way to go is to impose tariffs within the WTO framework. And we have that right to impose 99% tax on rice and 99% tax on poultry, to stop that. And that will encourage Ghanaians to produce these two items right here in this country. In another development, the Trade Union Congress has praised the government for creating 350,000 jobs in the public sector. It also lauded government's efforts in exiting from the IMF program. You know one thing that has happened in 2019, which is the best for this country? Our exit from IMF. Mm. That has given us the free hand to manage ourselves. For the first time in many years, or at least in three or four years, yeah. we are going to see if we are disciplined enough. Mm. And that is why government has established the Financial Stability Council, right, yeah. then the Fiscal Stability Council. Exactly. Now we are expecting the Social Partnership Council, okay. who should be launched very soon. 
so that employers and labor and government will come together and say, hey, don't go there. The Volta River Authority, VRA, has entered into an agreement with the Forestry Commission to establish a total of 270 hectares of bamboo and rattan species along the Volta Lake. The use of bamboo and rattan species is to help protect the Volta Lake from, by serving as a means of demarcation and to create a buffer zone to reduce encroachment. Here's a report by my colleague Peter Kwao Adato. The continuous low level of water in the Volta Lake and its attendant effect on power generation in the country has been blamed largely on climate change. Experts linked the unsustainable water level of the lake to the absence of forests and trees to protect the water. This prompted the VRA and the Forestry Commission to agree in the past to jointly protect forest reserves along the lake in the Nyau, upon Mansi, Ben West Block, Amama Shelter Belt, Tano of Fen, Jamera, Yankubi, and Apra Hills. However, some amendments and reforms to the operations of the Volta River Authority appeared to have affected this goal. The new agreement to strengthen the collaborative initiative followed extensive assessment of developments along the Volta Lake and the need to protect the environment. It's also expected that a 270 hectare bamboo plantation will be established along the banks of the lake to sustain hydro power generation. Unlike the previous agreement, the new deal focuses on the planting of bamboo and rattan along 270 hectares cover of the Volta Lake over three project phases. The signing of this memorandum of understanding is necessary to set the ball rolling for the commencement of the planting of bamboo for the protection of the Volta Lake to solve power outages and challenges in Ghana. The choice of bamboo and rattan was informed by their fast-growing, renewable and easy-to-grow resource. The use of the bamboo species is to help protect the Volta Lake by serving as a means of demarcation of the 280 feet which fall under the VRA acquired lands. Create a buffer zone to avoid encroachment of the VRA acquired land. Protect against erosion and prevent or reduce the rate of evaporation of the water lake. Promote the socioeconomic importance of bamboo for a sustainable development of the riparian communities. Bamboo are extremely versatile material with over 1,000 species and grows in tropical and temperate environments. It requires no irrigation and rarely need replanting. Again, charcoal made from bamboo plant has been described as a best, hence the project would help to reverse the dependence on forests and trees for fuel wood. That's all for the very latest in business news. You still watch Media Life here on TV3. We'll take a short break when we return. Well, UK-based singer Fuse ODG looks all set to launch his second album. Uh, the Antenna Hitmaker told uh, Natalie Barr that the new album is a wake-up call to all Africans to put their shoulders to the wheel to build a great continent. Released on Friday, March 8, 2019, The New African Nation is the second studio project of Fuse ODG after Tina, This Is New Africa, successfully laid down the foundations for the rise of Afrobeat sound worldwide in 2013. <laughs> The track album includes songs like Breffier, Thinking About It, Buame, Quality among others and features top local and international artists such as rapper and BET award winner Sakwadie, singer Muji's Grammy award winner Ed Sheeran, reggae superstar Damien J.R. Gong Marley and Jamaican UK star Steph Lindon. Him, this new project is to support and promote the integrity of Africa and not to make money. Well, it's, it's, not, it's not about money for me, you know, it's about integrity, you know, it's about um, doing the right thing for our people. I have, I've made enough money, you get it, and I'm still making money, so 
And when I make music, I make it for the people, you know. I feel like it's time we've, you know, managed to raise the platform and create this energy of love for Africa through Af Afrobeats. Mm. Everybody's interested in Africa. Now, what are we using this new energy for? We need to use it to build. So this album is about sending a message to our people. Now, now that we love ourselves, mm. what are we going to do with it? Of course, there's a lot more work to do, man. So, the Azonto hitmaker is determined to put together the infectious groove of his previous works with the conscious messages of previous black leaders. So definitely this album taps into a lot of different sounds and different vibes. It has the message in there. You know, the first album was Tina, this is New Africa, now we're doing Nana, New African Nation. And it's about building the nation physically and seeing physical results. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited. We've been getting some great feedback. The new African Nation album launch concert is slated for April 18 at the Plus 233 Jazz Bar. Well, that's all for Media Life here on TV3. Thank you very much for watching. We also stream live on Facebook. To end the news, a quick recap of our top headline stories. The NDC and the NPP have been locked up in a crunch meeting to end political party vigilantism. If we see anybody doing any of these things and arrest is not possible, we will shoot to kill, not to make. Ghana Great Company warns it will shoot and kill as there were attempts to ban its main pipelines. And elsewhere on the international front, Algerian parliament is due to elect an interim president following false resignation of 82-year-old Abdelaziz Bouteflika. That's all for the bulletin. Thanks very much for watching. For more news, you can log on to our website, 3news.com.